Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another episode of Deep Seated Geek. My name is Jason and I am your host on this wonderful show and thank you all who have uh, written in the comment section from the last video and saying hello and all that. Uh, you guys are great, thanks for tuning back in and I hope to hear from more of you. Uh, first things first, before we get to the show notes, this is of course a long episode here. So if you want to skip to the parts that you want to see the most, be it the gaming news, uh, the opinion piece, or what I'm playing, if you look down in the show description notes, you'll see little time codes there. If you click on those, it'll jump you right to the section that you want to get to. So, now that you know that, let's get on to the first round of gaming news. So the first bit of news that comes my way is that there was a new trailer out for a game called Soma, which is from Frictional Games. Now you may be thinking, I know that name from somewhere. Those are the boys who did the awesome Amnesia The Dark Descent. Uh, they didn't do the sequel, they gave that over to the Chinese room, the guys who did uh, Dear Esther, which I don't really care for, but that's beside the point. So they did a live action trailer for Soma, and it was a four minute little blurb of just confusion, and it looked like this kind of cyberpunky in outer space test subject thing. It was really weird, but cool. It gave you a kind of hint of what the theme is gonna be like. But the new one shows a bit of gameplay, and it looks like the set of aliens with a bit of Event Horizon scariness to it. I mean, if it's like a tenth of what Amnesia the Dark Descent was, it's going to be awesome. Set in space kind of thing. Oh, I'm just loving it. So if you go check it out, Soma uh, should be the 2013 trailer from Frictional Games. Check it out. Really worth looking at. Uh, the crap news is that it comes out in 2015 which is over a year away. So that's the sucky news, but maybe they'll jump it up. You know, some in a world where we have delay after delay after delay, uh, maybe someone will come along and they will bump it up. Speaking of delays, I just found this out from a friend just before recording this show. Uh, Watch Dogs, the much anticipated game from Ubisoft Montreal, uh, which was gonna come out with the launch of the PlayStation 4, and was going to be released on next gen and current gen and all that kind of stuff November 15th. Haha, <laughs> no, it's pushed back to sometime in spring 2014. So the one game that I had pre-ordered for my PlayStation 4 is not going to be there. So I'm all kinds of happy about that. But like everything, they gave the same kind of spiel on their blog where it's like, oh, we want to make sure we're going to do things right by our fans and everything, which means they had some technical fuck up that just wasn't going right for them, so they needed to figure it out because they don't want it to really bomb their launch of what could be a brand new IP for them, much like Assassin's Creed. Uh, so it sucks, but you know it's because something went wrong and they want to make sure it's going to be good for all of us. So... We can bite the bullet on that one. That's fine, but I've got my eyes on you, Ubisoft. Next one up is kind of a weird bit of news. Uh, Shadow Warrior, uh, which was released, uh, I think, only a month or two ago, uh, which you can get on Steam, uh, which is this crazy kind of first-person hack-and-slash kind of kung fu done right kind of game. Uh, but they've got DLC in the form of Visceral... Sorry, no... Viscera Cleanup Detail, which is a little indie game that's in development right now, uh, where you play... <laughs> I love the concept for this. You play the janitor on a space station that just went through, like, a dead space kind of evisceration, okay? Like, there's body parts and blood everywhere, and you're the guy who has to clean it all up afterwards. <laughs> I just love the premise. I would love to see that kind of turn into, this one's on the space station, this one's in Camp Crystal Lake, this one is in Saw, you know, just the guy who cleans up all this horrible, horrible stuff, from and from video games too, you know, like the guy who mops up after Master Chief, you know, or uh, Wolverine or something like that. It would just be so cool. So I love the concept of the game, but here's the kicker. Uh, Shadow Warrior is getting a Visceral Cleanup Duty DLC for its game. This is the nutty part. They're releasing DLC based on this game, 
That's still in alpha! The visceral cleanup duty is not even released yet! It's still being developed! And yet, the DLC for a different game came out before the actual game. That's just, like, my brain is all over that. It's weird. But it does look pretty cool. I love the concept. Check it out. Check out Visceral's, uh, they've got an alpha, alpha, alpha version of the game that you can play, and you can also uh, pre-order it, I believe, on Steam, because it was greenlit by the Steam community there. So check that out, uh, the DLC and the actual game. Next up, which is dear to my heart, oh, pun, uh, Kingdom Hearts 2.5 has been announced. It's going to be released uh, with uh, RE Coded and 358 slash 2 Days, which were two DS games, I believe, that uh, they released in the Kingdom Hearts series. Uh, but what's going to be happening is that, much like the uh, Kingdom Hearts 1.5 remix, uh, they're going to take those games, just their cutscenes, and mash them into... Kingdom Hearts 2, and that's going to be HD remake as well. So, the success of the first one, the uh, the 1.5 remake, was so huge. Of course, they're going to do two because, in my opinion, two was such a better game, like leaps and bounds better than Kingdom Hearts one. And I love the series, and it's just it's going to add to everything that's going to be coming out for Kingdom Hearts 3, which they also showed some gameplay for recently, and it looks pretty sweet. Uh, yeah, I wasn't too sure how they were going to do that. Like, I knew, like, yeah, you could bump up the graphics and everything like that, but the gameplay and, you know, but watching that gameplay footage, it just, like, it makes your jaw drop. It's like, oh, my God, I cannot wait to play that. Um, especially since someone told me, it might have been the Lord X, he may have told me this, that, okay, yeah, you've got Disney and Square, and that's the typical game for a Kingdom Hearts game. They take those two worlds and put them together and mash it all up, and it's just all kinds of goodness. But you got to think, Disney has changed since that time. Now they have acquired Pixar. Now they have acquired Marvel. Now they have acquired Star Wars. What is to stop Disney from taking all all those franchises and just mashing them all together makes you just drool with anticipation of what could happen and second to last uh there's a new indie game that's being developed uh called the long dark uh, I forget who the developers are. I'm sorry, I didn't write it down. Uh, but typically, it is a daisy like uh, survival game. I don't know if it's a survival horror game, but I think it's just you're in the woods and you're to survive. And the, uh, the art direction they went with it uh, kind of almost looks like watercolor kind of stuff, or almost like almost like a blend between origami paper cutouts and watercolor stuff. If you can imagine that, check out the trailer. Uh, but the cool news, this is really cool news for me. Uh, they've announced voice actors that are going to be in the game. Check this out. They have hired Jennifer Hale and Mark Muir, the male and female voices for Shepard in the Mass Effect series. Both of them are going to be in the game. Not only those two, but, I hope I say this name right, Elias Tof. Texas. <laughs> it's spelled really weird. Uh, T O U F E X I S. Elias to Fexis. I hope I said that right, but that dude is the guy who did the voice of Adam Jensen in one of my favorite games, Deus Ex Human Revolution. So you got Shepherds and you got Adam Jensen. And the latest announcement is that David Hayter, yes, Solid Snake himself, is going to be in this game as well. The voice cast alone on this game is making me just pre-order. As soon as I get one, just to pre-order. That's all there is to it. And the game looks pretty sweet too. So check it out. Uh, details, you can see a little bit of game footage and how it's going to play out with the survival aspect. And yeah, it looks like it's going to turn out to be a really great game. The last bit of news, and this just made my day, was that it was announced that uh, it is officially this year... Superman's 75th birthday. Yes, he was created 75 years ago. And to kind of celebrate that, uh, both uh, Bruce Timm, who did the amazing DC Universe in animation style, and Zack Snyder, the director of Man of Steel, have come together to put together a little short animated film that captures the entire history and development and media jumping that Superman has done over the years. It is the most heartwarming, just awe-inspiring, 
tear jerker I have ever seen given to a Superman treatment. It is beautiful, beautiful. It's only two minutes. You can find it on uh, EW.com or should be on YouTube by now, I would think. Check it out. It is so, so amazing. So that is all the gaming news I got. Now we're going to tune to what I'm playing. All right, guys, so we're going to talk about three games I've been playing this week. Uh, the first one of which was Beyond Two Souls, a game by Quantic Dreams, the makers of Heavy Rain and Fahrenheit, or if you're in the United States, it's Indigo Prophecy. Both great games, and Beyond Two Souls is a great game. Uh, there's a lot of criticism about it, and that's going to be the basis of my uh, opinion piece later in this episode, but I found it to be great. Um, like all of Quantic Dream games, uh, it's all about the story. That's what I love. And this was no different. Um, they always tell stories that could only be done in this medium. Um... Uh, if I had issue, it's not a perfect game. Like all their games, there are always uh, things that just don't sit right with me. Like Indigo Prophecies ending, I wasn't too keen on. Uh, there were little red herrings in Heavy Rain that went nowhere. Uh, and this game, there are flaws to it. Much to do with um, uh, just uh, really one of the biggest bones I have to pick with it is the darkness factor. Like when I'm going through the game and it starts to get dark in the environment, I literally cannot see and there's no brightness uh, option that I can correct that. So even going on my TV, turning up the brightness, it really didn't help matter. So I just felt like a doof walking around in the dark. But that's a very small complaint. Uh, for the most part, it was just amazing. Um, a lot of people talk about the sequence of events. It is chopped up in such a way that you are... Essentially, the game is a depiction of 15 years in the life of the character Ellen Page plays, uh, which is Jody something. It's great that I take notes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, you play uh, through the life of this girl who has this supernatural ability to communicate with an invisible friend, for lack of a word. Um, so the two of them are recruited for studies, and then the CIA gets involved and want to recruit her for military work, and then she runs away from that kind of deal. Those are bullet points that I'm not spoiling anything for you guys. Um, but the way it's told, it's like you will jump from a military game to she's six years old, to three years later, to... And now she's on the run, and then back again, and it flip-flops all over the place. And as a storytelling device, it really doesn't help the game, but I kind of get it. When you get to the end, it gives a little reason for it. It's not enough to convince me that it was the right way to go with it, but it makes sense. Uh, the acting in it is... I don't even have to... Go read a review, and that's all they rave about. It's just Ellen Page... Like, performance of the year in any kind of medium. Ellen Page. Uh, Willem Dafoe, everybody thinks he's a little campy, but I thought he did a good job. Uh, Kadeem Harrison. Dude, Dwayne Wayne is in this game, and he is heartbreaking. He plays it bang on. Um, yeah, as far as, like, the acting goes, it was great. The problem lies in the story in a couple of beats, where it's just like, you guys are taking the quick way out of this, and that, you know, and... Just little things that you couldn't get away with in uh, movies even, you know? So that's the, my only beef. Uh, I don't really have a complaint about the control of the game, like the gar character control, and um, that's a big beef with a lot of people apparently when you read the reviews. And I don't get it, you know? Because going into this game, I knew what to expect. I knew it was going to be story-based and everything else was secondary. Uh, Heavy Rain, they really want to try and drive home the idea that the motions that you're doing with the controls are contextual, like how you would do it in real life. They kind of put that aside in this game and just wanted to present you this story and have you, in the most minimal sense, be interacting. So I didn't mind that one bit. That's fine. I just wanted to be entertained with the story, and they did a great job. So enough of me talking about that. 
Beyond Two Souls, whether you read the critics that say it's garbage, whether you read the critics that say it's great, my personal opinion, I thought it was great. It's definitely worth a look, so check it out if you get the chance. Uh, the next game up was a little indie title called Outlast. Being Halloween, I figured I'm going to play through a bunch of scary titles because I just haven't played them a lot uh, recently. And this game... Well, <laughs> I was going to play it uh, on Saturday night, and then I just procrastinated, and then I thought, okay, I'll do it Sunday night, and I procrastinated again. So uh, yesterday morning, I woke up, and I had the day off of work, because in Canada, it's Thanksgiving, yay! And um, I woke up ex really early, like before the alarm clock, and I got the crusties out of my eyes, I sat down, and I thought, okay, well, let's just do it. It's still dark out, so it'll be atmospheric. And I played the game for 39 minutes, and it's the first time in a long time where I had to put the keyboard down and just go, I can't do this right now. This is messing with my head. <laughs> I mean, the game freaked me out so hard and made my heart just hit my chest so many times that like I was I was jittery for like a good long while. I had to go do other things just to calm myself down and then come back to the game and try and play through the rest of it. So <laughs> so it's definitely scary. Um, if you don't know the game, you can find trailers for it, but essentially you are like this this gung-ho reporter who's going to expose the wrongdoings in this mental asylum that you've heard rumblings about. Uh, <laughs> and I just love the way it kind of plays out. Like, the opening monologue that you read almost makes you feel like you're Archie from the Archie comics, and you're just, do 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 I'm going to go do my gee golly whiz thing here <laughs> with my camcorder, and oh, I'm going to get the scoop, and oh, my... You know, editor's going to be so proud. And then you go in, and there's guys who are mutilated, threatening to, like, rape you in six different holes that they're going to create. And you're just like, oh, my God! It's just awfulness. You know? So I just love the idea that Archie would go into, like... Like, there was that comic, Archie versus the Punisher. That exists in comics, okay? That was a real thing. That's what I thought about this. Archie going to the insane asylum. <laughs> That's just all kinds of awesome just waiting to happen. But yes, uh, the game itself, uh, the gameplay was much like Beyond Two Souls. It was very minimal. You don't fight. All you do is just run and hide, collect batteries so your camera doesn't die, and look through the world in night vision. Okay, and when you don't have night vision on, it is pitch black, so it is terrifying. Especially when you got a kick-ass pair of headset uh, headphones on. Uh, it, it is terrifying to hear like some dude walking back here with chains and you gotta hide and try and monitor the sound as he goes by so you can escape. And all these crazy creaks and like steam pipes and just guys laughing in the court. <laughs> you know, it's just unbelievably unnerving. Uh, so it did its job. It was fantastic. The story's not much to write home about. Uh, the actual play-wise is nothing that's going to change the face of gaming. The graphics were exceptional for uh, an independent game, and I believe it was based on the Unreal Engine. Don't quote me on that, though. Uh, so yeah, it looks good. It gets the atmosphere just right, like some of my favorite games, like Amnesia and uh, Dead Space. This has got that Asylum Gone Wrong motif down to a T. Uh, so Outlast. Check it out. I believe it's on Steam. Uh, it should be coming out on PlayStation 4 as well. So if you're holding out for something like I am, uh, it's definitely worth a look. So there you go. The last game on the list I want to talk about, uh, I have not finished yet, uh, but I plan to. Grand Theft Auto V. I want to love this game. Uh, it's got so many positive reviews, so many people are squawking about it. It's just like, it's the biggest selling thing ever, okay? Uh, it's broken seven Guinness World Records for any kind of entertainment medium. It's just insane how popular this game is. But once I started playing the game, I immediately remembered, oh yeah, I didn't like Grand Theft Auto 4 either. <laughs> so, and the... The problem with it is not the game itself. I, I can recognize, like, there are a bazillion different things you can do within this game. And there's so much attention to detail 
uh, in the world that it creates. That it's it's just mind numbing to think that this uh, this exists. Okay, uh, but the problem for me is that this is a game coming from the boys who did Red Dead Redemption, and I hold that game in such high regard. So I expected a little of that to come along for the writing, Grand Theft Auto. Now, some people are kind of happy that uh, Grand Theft Auto has kind of pulled back away from the dramatic kind of aspects of it, and it's got a little bit of its humor back again. And that's great, that's fine. The only problem is it's not humor I like. Um, I have a hard time getting behind a character who says the F word like every third breath. You know, it's just, uh, I think it was Martin Luther King or somebody, or maybe it was, um, was it Malcolm X? I don't know. It was some, you know, really worthwhile guy <laughs> who knows not to stumble on words, uh, who said people who use foul language are just showing uh, how uneducated they are. So when I know the quality of the writers for Rockstar, and I hear this coming out of their mouths. It's just like, you guys aren't trying hard enough, okay? And when another character, the N-word, you know which one I'm talking about, it comes out of every third word the other guy says, and it's just like, oh, come, come on, we don't really... You can get away with so much more without using those, you know? You don't have to. And then the third negative thing is that I really don't like playing bad guys. Like... I mean, you could argue that, you know, Nathan Drake is a bad guy because, I mean, he's going around, he's stealing artifacts from other people, and he's killing anything that comes in his way. But there's still that part where he wants to be a hero. I haven't found any heroic characters in Grand Theft Auto, and I have a real tough time with that. Um, especially when it's, like, blatant, violent kind of things, where it's like, uh, I think there were two guys that were looking for a storage locker... And two other guys from, like, another gang just walk up and say, Hey, what's going on? And everybody just starts shooting everybody. And it's just like, R really? Really? I know that probably happens in the world, but I don't find it entertaining. Um, I will say that I do like the character of Trevor, because he's a meth head kind of just gone off the rails. That's entertaining enough for some reason that I can get behind it. Maybe it's because of Breaking Bad. I'm just used to that. But, um... Yeah, I don't know. I'm just having a real tough time getting invested in these characters. I don't care if they succeed or die or, you know, fail or anything like that. And uh, I suck at driving games, so <laughs> it's really frustrating when I have to do a driving mission and I'm just all over the place without control. I'm horrible at it. Uh, I really, really dig, on a positive note, <laughs> I really do dig... Uh, the heist missions. There was one where he had to plan, like, you go up on the roof, hit the uh, air coolants and knock out gas in there, and you be on the ground with the getaway vehicle, and we'll jump inside with the mask and take all the jewelry. I love that! The planning it and getting away and going without, like, a, without a hitch, that stuff is awesome. And apparently, a great game for that is called Payday 2. <laughs> so I might just... I might finish Grand Theft Auto and jump right into Payday 2 for the stuff that I really like. Uh, I haven't tried online. Apparently that's had a lot of problems. And I'm one to kind of stand away from online issues until it's actually sorted. Uh, but that, the, guys, this is just an initial review. I've played maybe 10 hours of the game. The first four, I really was struggling with it. And then Trevor came along and I started to get a little bit of a feel for it. But still, I'm just not invested in the characters just yet. So maybe that will change. I don't know. You guys have uh, played this probably through to the end and are probably kicking ass online some more. So if you think that this is like worth getting to the very end for, let me know in the comments. Um, other than that, I'll still be plugging away at that and I'll be playing new games next week. So with that, we're going to move on to my opinion. So the thought that's been rattling around my head lately does revolve around Beyond Two Souls. Uh, when I went to go look up uh, a lot of reviews uh, to kind of gauge what people thought of the game, uh, it was very extreme. Like, people either loved it or they hated this game. There was no in the middle. And it seems like there have been a lot of games that have kind of come across that uh, in the last few years. Uh, I've got a couple, a few here to name. Uh, Beyond Two Souls, obviously. 
Uh, Resident Evil 6 was another one where gamers either loved it or hated it. Final Fantasy 13, uh, Devil May Cry, the new remake, uh, Remember Me, and Spec Ops The Line. And those are just a few. There are a bunch out there where people really loved or really hated these games. And all of them tried to do something new or different or innovative. Um, and they, they were kind of dissed for a lot of things. Or they were people focused on the things that weren't as innovative as what they had created that was new. So it's kind of a funny little conundrum that we're kind of in. Because my, my whole idea here is if something truly innovative comes along in a video game, would we recognize it or would we appreciate it? So, for example, uh, The Last of Us came out, which I loved, don't get me wrong, but essentially, the gameplay is nothing new from what we've experienced in all the Uncharted games. Duck, cover, shoot, and move along. The only thing that was different about that game was the characters, the setting, and the story. The gameplay, nothing has changed, essentially. Now, along comes... Uh, Beyond Two Souls. Everything is the same as uh, The Last of Us, where the story, the characters, and the setting is completely different from anything they've done before. The only thing that hasn't changed is the gameplay, essentially. You still control it in the same fashion as Heavy Rain, okay? Where you do contextual movements to uh, open doors, move forward, interact, uh, it's not to the extreme of Heavy Rain, but it's just basically the same kind of uh, point-and-click adventure kind of style. Now, people like just attacked the gameplay on this thing, saying, Oh, it's just crap, it doesn't work well with this game type, uh, they were slacking on it, what have you. Um, and they just kind of drilled into all the negative things, and they didn't recognize a lot of the things that were very innovative about the game. And it's very strange that a game like The Last of Us, you can overlook its shortcomings, but a game like uh, Beyond Two Souls, those shortcomings are the focus of the game. So it's very strange, you know, like, both games innovated in new and exciting ways, and yet one was critically acclaimed, and one is almost panned. So, it's very strange, and you see games all the time, uh, like Assassin's Creed, Call of Duty, uh, FIFA, NBA games, wrestling games, all these annualized games that really do nothing more than fine-tune the graphics. Gameplay pretty much stays the same. Characters almost stay the same. Uh, in some cases, setting is exactly the same, okay? Nothing is innovative about those games. When they came out, sure, they were innovative, you know? But from then on, what's changed? Like, honestly, Assassin's Creed especially, like, has anything really changed other than the setting? You still stealth around, you still stab guys, you still look like the same dude for crying out loud. And yet, those games have all had critical and commercial success. So it begs the question again, if something truly innovative came along, would we recognize it and would we appreciate it, okay? And it doesn't even revolve around the video games that are being developed, like the software. We can also talk about the hardware. Look at motion control, okay? The Wii came along and everybody thought, this is going to change the face of gaming. And yeah, Move came along for the PlayStation, and that also challenged Microsoft to come up with Kinect, and that's also a motion control. But that's really gone away, you know? Like, I know Kinect 2.0 is coming out, but the biggest, like, exciting thing from Kinect that I've heard so far is that you can say Xbox on and your Xbox will turn on. I mean, other than that, there's really no software out there that is going to innovate in that uh, realm of motion control. Even Nintendo, they've ditched the Wii remotes for touch-based things. And again, touch-based things. Tablets being integrated. Second screen innovation. Um... That is still essentially another controller. It's tactile, okay? So that's really not going far beyond what we're already doing. So how can that be innovative? Maybe they will come up with something. Maybe we just haven't seen it yet. But when it does come along, would we recognize it? Look at uh, Rock Band. 
Okay, that was very innovative with the controls and everything like that, but that's gone away. The Wii Remote, okay, that was very innovative for a time, but it's gone away now. So what is going to be the next thing that comes along, or what do we have to do? You know, is it Oculus Rift? That's just another screen, just on your forehead, man. Um, it's going to give you a different kind of sensory and everything like that, but is that going to be the sonic boom? Is that going to be the next evolution of how you game? You know, I don't know. But it's just, it's, this is the thing for me, it's, how do we recognize what's innovative? And when it, when it does come along, could we appreciate it? I've probably said that three times now, but that is the heart of uh, what's been rattling around my brain right now. And those are the examples that I have. But if you have examples as well, please let me know. Has there been something that you've discovered that you find innovative out there, be it software or hardware or just what have you, anything within the gaming realm? Because I just don't feel that we're in a position right now that if it did come along, we'd have the know-all to kind of appreciate it and jump on the bandwagon and take it to its next level. But I could be wrong. And that's it for the show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for tuning in and watching. If you dig this episode, like, favorite, and share with your friends and family. Hit subscribe if you haven't already, and tell your friends to subscribe too, because that just does my heart so much good. And for all you Deep Sea Geek lovers, and for those of you who have YouTube channels or want to get in on a gaming discussion, Deep Sea to Geek is going to be going live on October 27th, that's a Sunday, at 5 p.m. Central, that's 5 p.m. Central, Winnipeg, North American Time. Uh, the topic will revolve around horror games and horror themes within video games and gaming in general. So if you have something to contribute to that, please contact me. We can see if we can get you on the show, or you can be watching the show live and you can comment in the, the chat room there. We'll have guys monitoring that. And with that exciting news, we're going to say goodbye for now, and we will see you next week on Deep Seated Geek. Take care. <laughs>